So I'm here with the author of uh, Jaipur Journals. Her name is Namita Gokhale, and uh, she is also the co-founder of the Jaipur Literature Fest. Uh, here is, of course, the book Jaipur Journals. And uh, ma'am, to start off with, right at the outset, how was Jaipur Journals formed? Like, how did you uh, think of uh, writing the book? How did the idea come to you? Years ago, somebody suggested that I do a novel around the Jaipur Lit Fest. Mm. And I said, no, I'll never do this. I felt it was like my two lives shouldn't come together like this. I'm a writer. Mm. I keep my writing as a back burner in the Jaipur Festival. And I am the director and also hands-on uh, sort of working on the festival all the time. Uh, but the idea, na, as they say, the mark mein kida bed gaya. Mm. It just wouldn't leave me. And then when I was attending the festival, I would look at it with writerly eyes. Oh, there's a story there. I wonder what it is. Who is that person in the audience? And it was not about the stellar big names in the stage so much. as the people who came there, why they came there, what are the backstories? That's how it began. And so obviously, all the characters in the book are uh, based on a lot of people who you met at, at GLF. Not really. Okay. There are two people who are real life people okay. who, who appear on stage, which is Shashi Tharoor and Javed Akhtar. Both are presences on stage there okay. and uh, they were kind and gracious enough to let me make, make them characters, very stand on and fleeting characters in the novel. There is, talking of Javed Akhtar, there is a character, a burglar in the book who gets inspired from Javed Akhtar and then becomes a poet. Yes. So, uh, Raju Srivastav Betab. Raju Srivastav, nothing to do with the comedian? No. No. It's okay. only after he was called Raju Srivastava that I realized that, uh, yeah, we have the other Raju Srivastava. Yeah. And somewhere the conversation about the other Raju Srivastava does come in. Okay. And Betab was very much the name I felt his uh, pen name was that. Hmm. He actually came to me in a oblique way, hmm. in the sense that two years ago, there was a burglary in my house. Okay. And I woke up at night to find the light was already on one lamp and I looked around, I heard a creak and I saw that things had been moved around a bit. Mm. I walked out into the courtyard outside mm. and what do I see? But somebody sitting there and going through my handbags and going through all kinds of things mm. with the light on mm. in the courtyard. Oh God, and okay. I, instead of getting scared or cautious as any normal person would have, <laughs> I walked out there Mm. And I said to him very, I said, I remember saying it very affectionately and rather politely. I said, I'm here, Korn. And what are you doing here? Which should have been pretty clear that I'm a chore and I'm doing it here. So he got so startled by my odd behavior that mm. he slid out. And when he slid out, he had such magical movements. Mm. You know, it was like a dancer. It was like a ballet dancer. It was like he was floating in air. Right. He was a cat burglar. Mm. And then he was caught later and it turned out he was a very, very, it's a long story and I'll... No, no, but it's a good story, so please carry on. Yeah. So he got caught because he slipped out in such a way that he left his um, instruments behind. And then oh. when he came to look for them, by then I had alerted the police. Right. And I felt very sad about it because I feel in life, they never... Uh, they just end up going to jail. And when I told this to the policeman, he said, Aap NGO types are mad. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I felt that it is, and he gave me the great gift of the thought of this character mm. who is chosen a rather dishonorable profession mm. at which he excels. Mm. And behind it, in his heart of hearts, he is a deeply inspired poet. And how is the Jaipur Literature Festival, these two lives come together mm. when he meets Javed Akhtarji, mm, when he mm. gets a chance to recite his poetry on stage. Mm. And he is really a poet at heart. Right. So this is, all, in all the characters, there's this conflict between their inner lives mm. and the stories they are trying to articulate. Mm. And the circumstances uh, that uh, restrain or constrain their lives. You know, I, I really feel each of us has two novels or two stories within us. Yeah. One is the story of our lives, mm. the life script, what we have lived. And I found when you write that one, it's a very productive exercise. 
because you, you really investigate your own self and life and scrutinize it and it leaves you a, well, maybe not a better person, but a sharper person and a more self-aware person. Right. And the other story all of us have is the life we might have lived, mm. what might have been. Right. And many writers follow one and many writers follow the other um, narrative path and some follow both. Since you mentioned you've spoken so much about writers and books and stories, the summary of your book, it, it also mentions broken aspirations of writers who wander the earth with unsubmitted manuscripts in their bags and pen drives. So if you could elaborate on this just a little bit. So many of the people I know, meet have books inside them, in their head. And so many of them have actually written out yeah. long novels, mm. which they've never had the courage to show anybody. And sometimes that courage to show is because they are not, they don't want to be judged. They would rather believe in their own excellence or they oh. would rather hide the story. Or perhaps sometimes just the act of the writing that story and putting it out there is enough. They feel it's not their call. They've written the entire book, but they are not going ahead with publishing it because of their own fear or how they might be judged. This has nothing, of course, to do with a publisher not accepting the book. This is much before that. Well, yes. Your own fear coming in between. Absolutely. I've seen that again and again. And I wonder how many wonderful books are lying in the bottom drawers of people's homes or sometimes have been actually I've seen thrown into a fire or just lost and forgotten. You've also mentioned and do you, do you really believe that, that writers are uh, the loneliest of all? I think so because you have to be have that core of loneliness inside you to want to create that alternative planet which you inhabit in your writing. If you're so completely thrilled with your own life mm. that, uh, you know, you're just wondering, okay, I'll wear this tonight and I'll wear this lipstick, uh, I'll go out for dinner and I'll come home. The new home. Instagram generation, yeah. Well, I don't really know the new Instagram generation mm. so well. Mm. I do. But I think there are so many stories hidden behind those Instagram posts. There are. And I think so many of them are actually imagining and writing about or at least trying to understand that huge gap Mm. between the imagined and projected self mm. of Instagram mm. and the daily life loneliness in which I think the Instagram uh, generation perhaps the loneliest of all mm. because even their communication mm. is such a detached communication. Yeah, how many it likes is, am I going to get, how many shares am yeah. I going to get, how many people are going to see my story on Instagram, is anybody replying to my messages, yeah. You know, ladna, jagarna, mukke, marna, uski dusri intimacy hoti hai. Mm. That, that other intimacy, I, I, I'm not passing judgment on any generation because I think human nature never really changes. Mm. Just the means of communication in the last 20 years have radically changed. Right. But, and the nature of stories has also changed. But right. we are, our stories, as we remember them, our memories are always very, very selective. Us, we, what we remember as our story is not always our story, unless we are very, very honest about ourselves. That's a, that's a very deep line. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the audience to think about what she actually meant by that. And moving on, do you think, because I think it could be a good idea, but... Do you think that uh, the book could probably be adapted into a movie or series sometime later on with Netflix and Amazon and all these things coming I up? I would love that because I've been thinking about this. Okay. This is a story that is a natural right. to be told in a cinematic way. And, uh, I have a feeling that it would make a lovely um, web series or a, or a lovely movie. movie or a lovely Netflix, Amazon. Are you listening? If you yeah, are a hot star and anybody, and any yeah. of these guys, this is yeah, for you. Yeah. Whoever is going to get in touch with her first. It's a very hot property and a very beautiful story. I thank you for, uh, if I do get it, I will take you out for dinner. Brilliant, brilliant. And That's I'll, a I'll also go for a part in the series. I'm only booking myself there. Who do you want to be? Uh, that, that we'll discuss after the interview for okay. sure. Okay. Yeah, because I have, to, I have to read the entire book. And last question, yes. last question. At times, do you feel like reviving super? The, the film magazine, which some of you might not know, which used to publish in the 70s. Dil ki baat. I, mm. I've been thinking for a long time of putting together the best of super. 
because Supa was, uh, for those in the audience who wouldn't know, I was in college, I was this studious girl who turned up in the library before the librarian. Yeah. And for some odd and complicated reason to do with the college curriculum, I was, um, I gave the exam, but I'm not a graduate. Oh. And I was one topper type of person. Okay. So then I got so irritated with the system that I said, I'm going to start a film magazine. Mm. And those were the days when Bollywood wasn't Bollywood. It wasn't glamorous to do film magazines. It was glamorous, but in a different way. Mm. It was not an intellectually glamorous thing. So they all said, what's happened? Itna padhleke, now you want to start a film magazine? Mm. And we began, me and my husband, we began a film magazine called Super, mm. which for the seven years that it ran was just about the most brilliant, beautiful magazine ever. And uh, we had a very young staff. We had people like Ralph Ahmed, who was then very young, who went on to become a very, uh, became a very famous film journalist. And so all those people I'm in touch with, most of the people. Uh, Ralph was 28. He was the oldest. I wow. was I was 21. I was not the youngest. There was the a young 18-year-old who was a star reporter. And okay. the, the production values and the editing values were very good. So I've been thinking of bringing out a sort of a best of super magazine, which takes us back in time to those stories, those photographs, those heartbreaks, those romances. So let's see. It's been great talking with you, discussing the book. And uh, all the best for the future, ma'am. Thank you yeah, so much. Thanks.